would be interesting for me is where what background you have. So I can you raise your hand if you are a computational scientist? Okay. Any computer scientist here? Okay. Mathematicians? Okay. So what are the rest of you? There's lots of people that haven't raised their hand. Who are you? <laughs> are you physicist? Chemist? Biologist? There's still people who haven't raised their hand. <laughs> okay, cool. So um, I'm <laughs> gives me at least a little bit of a background. Um, I'm going to talk about provenance. Um, this is probably one of the topics that um, that is newer, as we discussed today. Can I ask who's heard about provenance? Wow, there's. A, it's not a large number, but at least some people have heard about it. Has anyone ever used provenance? No. OK, good. <laughs> well, I hope to convince you that, that provenance is a useful thing and that you might want to consider it moving forward. Um, just to give you a definition of what provenance is, because so many people haven't heard of it, um, typically we talk about provenance when we think of pieces of art, a picture or something. And provenance tells you basically um, how, who, who owned it, who done it, those kind of things, if it's the genuine item or if you, you just have a fake product here. So the provenance tells you its history. In computer science, provenance is really the record that describes the people, the processes, uh, the data that was involved to create something. And um, there, there are um, a number of uh, different uh, descriptions, and here's the W3C, sort of the, the main organization that does provenance and that brings out some of those definitions, if you want to look it up, and it's in, in, in my slides. Um, provenance has, a vocab has different vocabularies to describe um, these, these kind of artifacts, and here, here's just a few of them, and if you want to look them up later, Otherwise, just, just note that there are a number of vocabularies to describe it, different languages to describe provenance. So why, why are we interested in it? Um, scientific research today is, is quite a complex thing, and it's often quite collaborative as well. What that brings with it is it involves multiple people that, that are usually working on it. Um, you have people you have to talk to. You have to exchange your research results with and how you got there. Um, you leverage many different tools. We just heard, heard about workflows, where you have a series of different codes that you're using, and different data sets, maybe, that, that you use as input, different senses where you collected it from. Um, you have processes, if you think about it, how you get from your, your scientific research to a publication, there's all kinds of things involved, how you reduce it. And they are usually quite complicated. Depending on the field you're in, it takes maybe half a year to two years to get from your initial research to, to your publication. And obviously, you don't just sit there and twiddle your thumbs the whole time, but there's lots of processes involved. And the question is, after two years, can you still remember how you actually got there? And provenance is a means of describing, for example, the way how you got from your research to your publication. Um, what you will find with many things that you do is that, that to describe all the different steps is actually quite complicated. Um, science actually has a long history in describing what we're doing. Uh, certainly from the experimental side, all experimentalists have their, their lab notebooks where they describe every different step. Uh, of what they've done so that they can trace back how they generated their scientific results. On the computational side, we're not quite so good at that. We hope that because we wrote programs, it's all there. But it usually isn't, or we can't find it, or we can't remember it. And so we have to come up with a way that creates our lab notebook. And as we like to do things computationally, we like to just to save us a little bit of effort and try to automate those kind of things um, so that we don't have to write it all down and remember it all. And so provenance is a way of doing it. So what can provenance do for you in the context of research? 
Well, first of all, it can help you to explain results. Um, it can be you want to use someone else's data set. But to be able to do that, you need to understand how that was created. Can I trust it? If I put this in my, my code or use it in my research, I have to be sure how that data set was created. And if it's done in a way that doesn't, um, that how I would have done it maybe, or that it is of high quality. Otherwise, I might jeopardize my research if I use data that I can't trust. Now, usually we're quite particular about that, but you also have to think about you produce data that you might want to give to someone else or someone else wants to use, and they, they are just as picky about that as you might be. And so they want to be sure about how you created it. And so you have to have a way of communicating that. One way is to, to just talk to people, but provenance is another way. The other thing is what uh, reproducibility, what provenance can help, and we talked about this a little bit um, in, in the session before, um, you have a result, someone maybe questions it, can you actually show how you got to your scientific results? Can you show that you used the right way of doing it? Can someone else look at it and reproduce what you've done? And then the last thing is performance analysis, and that's a very new, new way of, of using provenance, and that's really to, to capture how your your application, your workflow performed, and compare that over time. We had this question, how do I know if my, my, work, my, my application is performing well? Well, with these kind of models, you can see basically um, how, it's, how it was done. Uh, does it compare to what was done before? Um, and what should I expect? Where might there be problems? And I'm going to talk about that as well. But let's start with a result explanation. So, there, there are, there's different levels of, of, of sharing your data. There is, I have a collaborator who works in the same field, who understands many of the things that I do. Um, there's the, I have a larger collaboration where I might have to share it. And then there's uh, things like, for example, the uh, atmospheric radiation measurement program that the DOE operates, which produces atmospheric measurements. And that's a real data center that shares it with a wide community and with different users with different levels of expertise. And so the question is, how do you tell the people what kind of data you have and how this data applies to their research? So um, I'm going to use an example from their site. Um, there is a, what's called a best estimates data set, which takes <coughs> atmospheric measurements. They are measured in a way that is not directly consumable by a model. They are then converted into properties that, that a climate model can use, and that data set is then, then given out. Clearly, people have to understand where this data is coming from and how this would have been done. So what we have here is sort of um, pages. There's the Earth Systems Grid Federation where you can find those data sets. And what you have is, is a, a atmospheric modeler, a CAM modeler, and it says, OK, um, what do these, where do these output variables come from? And what additional information can I have about this data to, to be able to assess it? How does it relate to the parameters that I have in my model? Um, atmospheric scientists, the, the other thing that you might have is that there's two date versions of a data set. How do they differ? What, what's the difference? Now, usually if you just get a data set, there is very little information. It might tell you what, what uh, fields are in there and what the properties are, but it doesn't tell you how it was generated. To do that, you have to go back, and in this case, to look at how was this written. Um, there's, there's descriptions on web pages. Um, there's header files. There's technical reports. There might be some information about how the data was created. But to get this all together is quite complicated. And you would have to read through all of this. Um, most people don't do that. And so um, what you can use provenance for is to tie all those different bits of information together and create one record or one report that actually tells you all the, the basic things that you need to know about a data set. And, and that's what we did. So we pulled out the different things, made the connections, so you have 
get one summary report that tells you all the key things, but it also points back to the source. So if you find something, you say, well, that sounds really strange. Where is this coming from? How was this done? I can go back to the source and say, oh, let's take a look. How was that really done? Do I believe in this? Would I have done the same thing? Or do I have to do something different? Do I might have to treat the data differently because it was created in a way that was unexpected? And so provenance allows you to, to find that out and, and go back in a very easy way. Um, and this is really the, as I talked about, you have the cross-referencing between the different sources of provenance of how it was pr um, uh, created. This data is in a, in a database. You can search through it. You can analyze it. You can uh, compare information between different things. And you can pull out reports that help you. And with that, the user is then than able to answer the question. Um, as I said, there's quite a number of languages out there. We used one particular one to do this and developed a data store, uh, the provenance uh, environment proven that has the whole server and has the language in to describe this data and to create um, the reports and the queries for the users to do that. That's one system. There's others out there, but this is just, just an example. So basically, what it does, it uh, captures historical information from any native sources that have been referenced in this case. Um, we store the information in a cross-reference way. So there is a semantic data store that links different things together. And then we can, can basically use this to, to, to go through this and analyze it in the way that the users need it. That is the classic way of how provenance is used. You basically describe the data set. You try to collect as much information along the way of how a data set was produced, link all this together, and then allow people to analyze it in different ways. Different user groups for your data might have different needs. But it basically gives you a, a record on how things have been, been done and a way, a standardized way to share it with others so that they can read it and understand it. It's usually linked to a domain-specific vocabulary, so you can annotate it with your specific domain, whether it's biology or materials or something that tells you exactly what you need to know in, in the form that you need it. The next thing I want to talk about is reproducibility. It's a hot topic at the moment, uh, largely because we've had quite a number, uh, high increased rate of publications that have been rejected after acceptance because faults have been found in the research when, when, when further, further investigated. And so the, certainly the funding agencies in Europe and in the US are very keen on an increased level of reproducibility in the science to make it testable, more easily testable. Um, and so reproducibility is defined as the ability of an entire experiment or study to be reproduced, either by the researcher or by someone else working independently. It's one, as I said before, it's one of the main principles of science. Um, there are different levels of uh, reproducibility. There is the actual replication of something, so really doing the same experiment again. But there's also scientific reproducibility, which means I can understand your process and I can recreate the same results with other methods that are comparable to the one that you have used. And those two things shouldn't, should, should be considered in any case. But you have to have the information for someone else to understand your process well enough to be able to do both the, the pure replication to the reproducibility and know that you're not comparing apples and pears, but it's really the same thing. When it comes to computational reproducibility, there are a number of, of other uh, things there as well. Uh, there's the numerical reproducibility, uh, in particular when we are working in high-performance computing systems um, with high levels of parallelisms. It really depends on your algorithm if something is numerically reproducible, if you run it again even on the same system. Certainly, once you change any parameters, the compiler, the libraries you're using, the number of cores you're using, those kind of things. It really depends 
on your mathematical formulation of your algorithms whether you can get numerical reproducibility. Um, in any case, you should be able to identify or define what the variation is in your code and how, how big it is and still get the same uh, scientifically correct results if you run it again. Experiment reproducibility is really, uh, do we have all the information to run the same simulation again? Um, and then the execution reproducibility, can we recreate the whole execution environment? Do we know how, where, what, what was the environment in which we executed it? So when is reproducibility particularly needed? Well, this, this comes back to what I said before. Um, you've you've um, published a paper and your results are queried and you that are based on simulations that you've done. Can you explain what you have done? Um, there's plenty of papers that if you go in and try to recreate the results, you will find that the paper doesn't describe it well enough. There's no background information to describe it. Even if you repeat what they describe, you don't get the same results. You get questions, how do you explain that? In particular, if it's maybe a year ago or longer when you did those calculations, you don't want to get a reputation that your science isn't good just because people can't reproduce it. Um, sharing your new, you found a new method to do something. And you would like to share it with others. Can you remember what you've done so that someone else can actually recreate that? That you can, can share this, even that you can re repeat the, what you've done and do it again. And then just comparing results. I've ran, run a simulation my collaborator ran a simulation. We both got different results, although they should be similar. Why are they different? Where are the differences coming from? Can you explain that? So bearing that in mind, think about you have a single application and you need to re uh, reproduce it. What kind of information would you need? Tell me, what do you think? What do you need? Input parameters, Input parameters yes. Yeah. Sorry? Platform. Yes, platform, absolutely. Anything else? Would it be useful to know what application code we yet ran? Version. <laughs> Version, yes. Good, so I think you, you co covered most of the things. That's, that's exactly right. So you need to know what parameters did you use to run your calculation. What input data files you have, you might have used? What simulation model did you use? Which version? Which of the select, which methods within your code? So many times you have a big application code. You start it, but, and you run it, but you don't run every single part. You will just run se separate, uh, selected methods within it. So if you want to compare the results, you need to know which methods did you run. <coughs> Um, if you run it again, maybe one of the methods had changed. There's a new version, and you get a different result, so you better know what you ran. Um, you need to know, quite frankly, which compiler you used, what optimization flags, which libraries, what system software, what system did you run it on. All of that is necessary to, to have a chance to, to reproduce your, your, your simulation. So how can we can provenance help? Well, provenance provides a standard language to describe those kind of things. Um, what happened and how the things relate to each other. You have classes and provenance, and they describe things like the simulation model, the compiler. They have subclasses like name and version vendor, parameters, those kind of things that you can associate to them. And then you have properties in which you link those things. So you have, for example, simulation model is a class, was compiled with compiler. And then you have simulation model has version, and then you have a version number. And so you build up those, those tuples or triplets, and you have them there. You can do that automatically once you set it up. The system can actually uh, collect those things. So you don't, it's not 
too cumbersome for you. It's just something you have to set up at the start. And then you get those, you store them in a, uh, in a database, and you can go back to it. You can link different ones of them as well. They say, okay, this is the first simulation I ran, then I ran this one. And you can see how things change. You can also take those, those records and say, okay, I ran this and my colleague ran that. Now let's compare what might have been different. Maybe there was a different compiler version. Maybe they used a different version of the input data set. Um, all those kind of things. But it helps you to figure out and, and, and hone in very quickly as to what was the difference. It also just gives you a record that you can give along um, as background information, for example, to uh, auxiliary information for a publication that says, this is what I ran and this is what I did to get the results. Using a standard provenance format means that it's easy for others to read it and to analyze it. So now consider you want to, so that, that's quite, quite involved already and you have to think of many different things, probably depending on your application. Now consider you have a workflow, a complex one. What do you need to capture then? So obviously we need the application details for each application, how the applications are connected to each other. But we also have to think about where were they executed. Not all workflows will execute on just one system. They might be executed on different systems. And so you have to capture that. Each of them comes then again, with their own environment. We need to think about how the different applications might influence each other. Did they talk to each other? Were they delayed? Did that change how, how I, what my results? Did I have any changes occur uh, during execution? So workflows, for example, are often used to restart things. My code didn't quite run through, so I restarted it. Maybe I restarted with slightly different parameters. Well, I better know about that if I want to, to be able to, to reproduce later on what I've done. And did the workflow management system do anything that, that had an influence on what I did? Did they decide to move something somewhere else? Did they move the data differently? Did they use different data? Often you have in workflow something that says, pull my data from here, but if it doesn't work, then pull it from that side. Maybe I need to know that. Maybe there were different versions of the same data at the different sites. Could be. So it would be useful to have all of this. Now, traditional workflow provenance, um, work, many workflow systems today do actually um, capture basic levels of, of provenance. So they capture what input data and what applications. They usually don't go into too much detail. But, but they have some of it. The level of detail varies quite a bit. Not all workflow systems uh, capture provenance in a standard way, which makes it then more difficult to maybe integrate that with other work you've done. That, that is a bit of a problem. But other systems connect it, collect it really in standard provenance formats, and that makes it easy. Um, systems like Galaxy, for example, capture provenance very fine-grained. So they really track everything you do, including steps where you went back and say, well, that didn't work, and I tried something else. And they will give you a record that says, this is exactly what you did, and this is the way that, that brought you to your success, extracting some of those, those, those sideways that didn't work out. So that can be really helpful if you have processes that are very it where well, you have to try several times to find just the right approach to do it. But it gives you then a record where you can say, okay, this was really the way that I used the pathway from my start to my finished result. And it's done for you without any of your involvement. There's an automatic system behind it that does that. But you can tell what, uh, what it is. Um, what you have to, to decide to some extent is what level of provenance is enough to support reproducibility for your particular science? How variable is it what you do? How um, straightforward is the analysis process? Are there standard ways of doing it? Or is this really every time a research project to find out 
what you need to do. And that will determine what kind of, what level and what extent of provenance you would have to capture. Um, we looked at this uh, a little bit more to think about what information do we think uh, we would have to capture if I have complex workflows so that I can really reproduce it and understand what has happened. So this is the, the classic pro, uh, or basic provenance information that workflow management systems capture. It's just input data, application, output, that goes into the next application, and that, that is basically it. Um, if you're lucky, they capture which version you used and where the data or the code may have come from, but not always. What they don't capture is necessarily what workflow management system you used and what the workflow management system did. Now, if it largely stayed out of it, it's fine, but it could have an influence on what you're doing. So it might be worthwhile to check that, to, to record that as well. There could have been a problem with the workflow management system in that particular version that you only learn about afterwards. And only through this way you can find out whether it might have had an influence on your results. However, we think that you probably need more. You need to understand the system environment, the soft system software that you use, so the libraries, the compilers, protocols, all those kind of things on the systems where you were executing your, your software. We found many times that when you used different compiler, different compiler flags, the results weren't quite the same as what we had before. And then it's good to understand why that is the case. Is it just within the margin of error and it's fine, or is there a problem? Is there a problem with the code, or was it just a change in the compiler? And the same thing is for which system did you use? I worked at some point at an organization, I shall name the name, and one of our processes went. And it took us about three weeks to find out that it had gone wrong. It was a multi-core processor, just one of, of the cores had gone, but it did th funny things like two times two was six. Now, if you have that, it's very difficult to spot, but I can tell you it will have an effect on your, your results of your science. And if you don't know that you ran on this system and on that core, you might have to do all your work again just to be sure that your results are correct. So we think that you need all those kind of different information. Um, as we discussed before, you need to open up the black boxes that, that are applications. We can't just say, I ran this, but I really need to know what I ran, which parameters I used, those kind of things, which methods. And then I want to capture, really, if you think of a workflow, it's like a time series, a changing thing. There's different applications running at different times, not all of them always at the same time. When were they executed? How were they executed? Uh, what are the dependencies? And you would want to know that. That brings a change into the provenance model as well, when you suddenly think of it as a time series. And so, um, we developed, and other people are looking at that as well, uh, workflow provenance models that really describe this, this dynamic process of what's there, including all the different uh, characteristics that you, and information that you need to know to, to ensure that you can do, uh, have reproducibility. Uh, users of, of those kind of technologies are, for example, the, the ACMA project, where you have a large number of scientists who are running these calculations. They have to all work together. They have to understand what other people have produced, how it compares, why are they different. Um, they do lots of statistics across their, their different applications. So they need to understand if I see a spike, if I see a variability, is it because we set the project, did we set up everything the same way? Are we sure we've run the same, same thing just with, with a, expected parameter variations or is something else different in the environment that could have caused the change in the output results. Being able to do that, you need a provenance environment that can capture, in particular if you have distributed workflows, this prov provenance obviously automatically, you don't want to do this by hand, 
Uh, so what you can do is there's two different ways. You can have uh, harvested from, from uh, existing information that might be there, that's written out by the programs anyway, or you can have a more, more active a uh, little library calls in your code that writes out the provenance information uh, at the different steps, um, both from the submission stage to running the code. And then you have something at the back end, um, a, a provenance store that captures this. There is a listener there, and that, that captures it. So the last thing I want to talk about is a, is a new use, which I think is quite exciting for, for provenance, and that's really perfor for performance analysis and performance recording to some extent. Um, the, the reason we were interested then is coming from the complex workflow work. Um, if you have a complex, we talked about it, how difficult it is to assess whether my code is running well if I have a single application. If you have a workflow, it's far more, even more difficult to establish where is it running well. And if it's not running well, why is it not running well? Because it's not just the codes that are involved. It could just be the underlying system. You're moving files from one, one application to the next. There could be something on the disk. You might be competing for resources with someone else. All those kind of things could, could be influencing your performance. Now, if you run a workflow where um, it would be nice if it ran faster. That's one thing. Uh, what I'm going to talk about, and that's sort of a key driver behind it, are workflows where we have a fixed time in which we have to com be completed reliably. And for that, it's absolutely crucial that we can say it's running in that time and it will always run in that time. Or if not, we know when it starts to diverge and we can take measures to speed it up again to, to finish in that time. Uh, one of the key drivers for that is, is experimental work. So there's many uh, large-scale experimental facilities around the complex. Um, at Brookhaven, we have one the, the newest synchrotron in the DOE network. It's the brightest one uh, that we have. Um, with this new, it was only opened last year, and what you find with this um, it's not just lots of new, exciting uh, instruments, but these instruments produce vast amounts of data. Um, we have data rates that can go up to uh, a terabyte a second that the scientist would like to, to analyze. But it's not just that. The experiments are getting more complex every time. And so to steer them takes a lot of expertise. So what the people need now what the scientists would like to see is real-time analysis and feedback as they're doing the experiment so that they can steer the experiment to, to an optimized scientific outcome. That means you have to complete your workflow steps in a certain time. If you're 10 minutes late after the experiment is finished, you're not really that, that relevant any longer. It's like the, the weather forecast where which you get a day later where it told you it was raining the day on the, on the day of your barbecue. It just doesn't, doesn't really do it. So this is really important. And so um, here, here's one of the, the um, experiments for which we do this, for example. Um, the analysis steps are quite complex. You start from, from single, simple statistics to... Um, machine learning and, and other applications to uh, vi streaming visual analysis to bring this all together in a way that, that uh, the scientists can make decisions on it. And it's a streaming uh, data analysis workflow. So it's quite complicated. It usually runs on different systems because you have a computer at the instrument itself. You transfer the data to a high-performance computing system, run something there. And then you have to send some of the results back to the computer. So you have a distributed environment. And in that, you want to be able to, to run within a certain time frame. So the general challenge is obviously the speed and accuracy and completeness but, um, and the information selection, all those kind of things. But, but all of that um, is important. But essential for all of this is, is a reliable, that you get your results reliably Within a, in, in, within a certain time frame. And so um, 
We're involved together with Pacific Northwest and uh, the San Diego Supercomputing Center in, in a project uh, that's called Integrated End-to-End -end Performance Prediction and Diagnosis for Extreme Scale Workflows, which goes from the performance modeling to the analysis and prediction of workflow performance and, and its analysis to see where, where our bottlenecks are and really looking at sources for workflow variab performance variability. There are, um, these are funded by, this is funded by Oscar. There are three more projects that do similar things at, at other labs as well, but we're all looking at this, this same complex with different methods. Uh, one of the ways that we are do, uh, integrating provenance in, into that is really to collect quantitative informa performance information across workflows in different environments, uh, looking for the variability, the degradation, sensitivity, and impact. Uh, by capturing this information, uh, bringing together not just the performance measurement, which you see more often, but together with the understanding of what kind of workflow have I run, what are the differences between the workflows and the performance, what is the different setups, what is the difference in performance. Um, we have a much better understanding of the workflow performance, uh, the, the, the possible uh, bottlenecks and, and areas for, for, for improvement in the workflow. And so um, this is basically here, here again what I said before. So you capture all this information um, for um, the applica each application. You then look at performance metrics that you can, can collect for that. Um, you would also look at um, the parallelism. Do all the, my parts of my code run at the same speed? Do they vary? Do I have performance imbalances here? The problem is always with a the workflow, these things have knock-on effects. If I have a single application, one, one part runs slower or several parts run slower, yes, my whole application runs, runs a little bit slower. If I have a workflow, those kind of things have knock-on effects that can, can multiply as you go through. And so knowing that is quite important and where it's caused. Um, if I have, for example, write to disk, um, it might not even be my own fault that something is going slow, but another program might be writing to the disk, and so it's a, um, rare, starting to become a constrained uh, commodity. And I need to know whether that was the case or whether it's something in my code that I need to, um, to improve. Capturing interdependencies that was mentioned before in a workflow. How do the different parts of the workflow interact with each other? How do they affect the performance? Do, if, I, if this one runs really s slightly slower in parts or in total, how much does it influence the next one? Or can it cope with it? Can it overlap with it through different communication patterns? And then the workflow, the performance behavior over time. As I said, you are executing not always all the parts necessarily of a workflow. Which part, which influence has it on performance? And so we added to um, the, the performance model, the provenance model that we had, we, we added, added character, characteristics and metrics that captured performance um, in, at different levels, uh, from, from network metrics to interconnect storage, application, all those kind of things. And they are captured in a, um, in a time series database and then linked. So you have your normal provenance record for the workflow of what has been done. And then you can see, sort of run like a movie through your workflow to see what, how did it perform at different stages. And you can check why is that? Which parts did it execute? Where did it go slow? Now, if you do a single run, that doesn't do it. But if you do several of those, if you do an empirical study, that gives you sort of a feeling for how big is the variability. If it's 5 or 10%, you might not care. It's fine. If you can have variabilities in certain areas of 50% in performance, you might want to take a look and see what, what caused it. And so we can use, um, because we have a standardized vocabulary in provenance, and we have... Uh, um, have it in an archive, we can then use things like machine learning to look for patterns. 
Um, we can look for patterns across a particular workflow. But for a facility, for example, we can use the same archive if it's shared between different applications to see, can I see patterns for the underlying hardware? Are there certain um, resources that are constantly oversubscribed and are causing applications to go slow, for example? So that can help with it. And then obviously having the archive means that the users can go in and look for all kinds of different things. Um, they can look for, for changes. They can look for specific metrics. Um, they can look for, for verific can, can do verification on it, all those, those kind of things. So we think that that is an exciting extension to the normal provenance that you might collect for a workflow anyway um, to help you if you are in a situation where performance is really critical to you. So overall, I, I hope I've convinced you that, that provenance can, can be actually quite helpful uh, in different ways, but in, in all parts of your research. Um, and if you have any questions, please go ahead. Let's say we've run a workflow, and we've generated some output data and captured any provenance that we're interested in. When we share that data, how can we bundle or couple the provenance with the data so that collaborators who get the data can use, can reference that provenance and maybe append to it um, for, uh, in their workflows? Um, I think there's different ways. So you can just um, run a report out that, that tells you that, for example, uh, and add it as another file to your data. Um, there's also sh sites that share workflows, for example, uh, where you could add that as well. Um, there's work afoot where you can use that provenance to actually build your job again. So if people wanted to rerun it, they, they could do that. And you would just point back to your provenance archive to do that. Okay, so are, these, are there any uh, standard file formats um, for, to represent uh, this, the different kinds of provenance? Um, file formats, no, but they're, they're, provenance is usually um, represented as triples, so you could just have them in an, in an ASCII file or you have a little database that you give along. So I have a question about this as it relates to, um, I guess, the big picture. Um, parts of this would be relatively easy to do within an application, right? So you mentioned libraries and API calls and the like, but what about the b bits that are outside of that? Are you asking for maybe schedulers to supply this information at runtime to a, you know, or to a database, or how does it how does it work outside of the uh, application, where uh, as it applies to what the application is doing? Yeah. Um, so uh, we what we've done for for ACME, for example, there there is a system that that um, facilitates this job submission and and the job monitoring, and that collects that kind of information. So again, it's an automated process, and you don't have to do that. Um, most systems actually provi are, are providing this information. It's just a question of harvesting it. It's not that we ask it to produce anything that it doesn't do already. Can you comment if uh, this would cause any overhead to the actual program? So the, the, um, the basic provenance for, for uh, ex result explanation or for, for reproducibility no, that is actually not that much information that you need to capture. Uh, when it comes to the performance work, you have to be quite careful, and we, we are looking at that in particular. When you have uh, really um, highly parallel codes, you could easily produce vast amounts of data in terms of the metrics. And so what we're currently looking at is to, to add um, in, in situ analysis, basically, that reduces that, data, that provenance data on on the system itself. So you don't you only collect interesting interesting events basically and reduce it, compress it quite a bit at that point. Otherwise, yes, you could easily produce more provenance than, than your code produces data and, and influence it. But if you reduce this, you can can keep it to a very small amount of overhead.